Hello, everybody. Today and in this lecture, I'm going to be discussing water, one of the most abundant substances on Earth and something that is very important to have a, a good reminder of and a good understanding of for any time that you talk about a substance in a, solu in a solution. And, you know, that's what we're dealing with when, we, when we're in a biochemistry class. So this is just to, you know, lots of this is probably a, a refresher. Um, but this is just to bring you back to an aqueous environment as opposed to an organic environment and water being our, our primary solvent. That's what's really going to be kind of relevant and important to us. Now, with that said, I have to do a couple of things on my presentation mode here and I will get that squared away, share screen, done. There we go. Okay, so water. And Mammalian cells are about 70% water. The earth is about 75% covered in water. Two thirds of our water is inside our cells and one third is outside of our cells. Now, why is water important? Well, water is a solvent for biological systems. Hydrophilic compounds interact or, and dissolve with water. They dissolve in water, they interact with water. Um, and your hydrophilic compounds are those which love water. Your polar and ionic compounds are substances that dissolve really well in water. Now, of course, you have some exceptions to these. Um, for instance, an ionic compound, there are insoluble ionic compounds, but if you remember Gen Chem 2, one of the things you talked about was solubility constants and um, what percentage effectively of something would dissolve in water and what would remain as a precipitate. Hydrophobic compounds, on the other hand, do not interact with water. Now, most of your hydrophobic compounds are mm -hmm. your, your organic molecules, uh, your nonpolar compounds. So we're going to be looking at both polar and nonpolar compounds. Both polar and nonpolar compounds, but arguably the ones that are we're quite often going to be talking about polar substances uh, because those will dissolve and those will interact with water. Um, and so that's going to be something that's important for us. However, hydrophobicity and how hydrophobic or how nonpolar some, some substance is, is also going to be a, a very important part of uh, proteins taking on a three-dimensional structure. Now, with that said, Let's dissect and compare polar and nonpolar substances. A polar substance is a substance which has an unequal sharing of electrons. Um, polarity is ultimately determined by the electronegativity of the atoms within a compound. And, you know, this right here, sorry, I need to. Um, I found this on the way. Uh, I need to draw a little bit more of a straight line there. Um, electronegativity, I think the first time that you hear that term is Gen Chem 1. And you talked about the Pauling scale of electronegativity, or another way to look at that is the periodic table. And over here, where I just drew that X, is where fluorine is. Fluorine is your most electronegative element. Um, so this is bringing back something that's fundamental to Gen Chem 1. So always think about whenever you're looking at a molecule, what is the nature of the atoms within that molecule? What is the structure of that molecule? And how are those electrons shared? Are they equally shared or are they uneven, un, unequally or unevenly shared? Now, electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons. And here we have some examples and pretty much our most important uh, elements when it comes to biochemistry and biology oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, phosphorus, and hydrogen. Like I said a minute ago, and maybe you remember this from Gen Chem 1, fluorine is your most electronegative element. However, fluorine doesn't play a huge role in most of the biological processes and molecules that we'll talk about in this class. So it's kind of omitted from this list. But oxygen, very electronegative. So within a bond, a carbon-oxygen bond, that oxygen is going to want those electrons, which if you think about a carbonyl group, for instance, we've got lone pairs of electrons. Oxygen is pulling, it's more electron dense than say that carbon. 
which is why when we talked about sugars, for instance, we had a partial positive charge on our carbon and a partial negative charge on our oxygen. So we have that, that polarity, that uh, imbalance and unequal sharing of electrons in that right there due to electronegativity of all of these different atoms. Um, and just to look at your, your atoms that are most polar or that are most electronegative and least electronegative, kind of grouping them like that. That scale, that 3.5, 3.0, 2.6, 2.5, 2.2, 2.1, that is numbers coming from the Pauling scale of electronegativity. If you remember that scale was uh, one to four, or actually it was zero to four, zero being the least electronegative atoms and four being the most electronegative atoms. This was proposed as I alluded to, uh, Linus Pauling, hence the Pauling scale of electronegativity. Now a dipole is polar molecules or polar bonds and molecules are also known as dipoles. Polar means an unequal sharing of electrons and electrons have, an electro have a negative charge. The atom with the greater electronegativity attracts the electrons, giving that atom a partial negative charge. The remaining atom in the bond therefore has a partial positive charge. So like I showed here, partial negative, partial positive charge represented by our carbon and our oxygen. Um, so the atom of the bond, or each atom of the bond has a different partial charge, thus the term dipole, two poles, one positive and one negative pole. Now, to look at a molecule like methane, methane, I think that is pretty much your, your most basic organic mm -hmm. molecule, thinking about gen or organic chem one, methane is nonpolar. It has nonpolar bonds and it has mm -hmm. a symmetrical structure. There is, so this is nonpolar for a couple of different reasons. Each one of these bonds, our electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is a very small difference. So if you want to determine if a bond is polar or not, you take the electronegativity 2.5 minus 2.1 and you get 0 0.4. That's a very low difference. In addition to that, this molecule is completely symmetrical. It has carbon-hydrogen bonds at every, uh, or in, in all possible directions. So even though this right here, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, even though that electronegativity difference is not zero, it is low. So there is slight polarity this would not be classified as a polar molecule due to the fact that these bonds offset one another. So I always kind of think about it as almost like a game of tug of war. So whenever you're playing tug of war, you have the flag in the middle and here's your team and your team. If this one, X sub one, X sub two, those are our two teams. If X sub one is pulling with a force of 0 0.4 and X sub two is pulling with a force of 0 0.4 also, does this flag right here, does it move at all? It doesn't, it won't because of the fact that these two forces are gonna completely offset one another. Okay, so one thing that's worth noting and keeping in mind is that a carbon hydrogen bond, the electronegativity difference is so low that these bonds are never going to be considered polar. Now, a carbon-hydrogen bond can be found on a molecule that is polar, but that carbon-hydrogen bond, the electronegativity difference is so low that they are nonpolar. They are always nonpolar bonds. They are never polar bonds. Okay. Now, if we look at something like water, water is a polar molecule. Water is our universal solvent. Water is polar for two reasons. One, it has polar bonds. So oxygen, hydrogen. Our electronegativity difference, 3.5 and 2.1. This bond right here is 1.4. This bond right here is 1.4. So the greater the E negativity, 
difference. The more polar the bond. So those two bonds, the oxygen, hydrogen, those two bonds are polar bonds. Now, if you look at this molecule, what's also worth noting about this is that these two oxygen hydrogen bonds are not directly across from one another. So they don't cancel one another out. What oxygen has is it's also got these lone pairs of electrons. So these lone pairs of electrons are going to exist in these orbs and basically they're going to force those oxygen hydrogen bonds to not be opposite one another, but be angled, which is going to lead to water having an overall nonlinear and bent structure. So those polar bonds do not cancel. Water is not a symmetrical molecule. And what that leads to is these oxygen hydrogen bonds being polar and not canceling out. Okay, so the key there is that this has bonds that are polar and an asymmetrical structure. Those two things make water a polar molecule. So asymmetry, and polar bonds make this uh, non or make this a polar molecule. Carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide has polar bonds. Here's some information. Gosh, sorry. Um, these polar bonds, or is, sorry, it has polar bonds, but this is a nonpolar compound. This is a linear molecule. These are equal and opposite. So what we've got is let's go ahead, we can calculate from what I previously proposed and what I previously presented, the electronegativity difference. So oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5 and carbon is 2.5. Oxygen is 3.5 and carbon is 2.5. 3.5, 2.5. So each one of these bonds has an electronegativity difference of 1.0. Now that Electronegativity difference, whenever you're calculating it, it doesn't matter which number you put first because it's an absolute value. Take the two numbers, subtract them from one another. If you get a negative, well, it's an absolute value. So if, it's you, if you were to input that information as 2.5 minus 3.5, well, 2.5 minus 3.5 is negative one. But again, you wanna look at the absolute value. So you put it in as one. Okay, so we've got these electronegativity differences, but, so these are polar bonds, yes, but they are directly opposite one another. Why is that? Well, it's because oxygen is going to have lone pairs of electrons, and this isn't one bond, but rather it's two bonds. And that takes you back to a little bit of Gen Chem 1, um, but it's, it's still important to, to recall that. Um, so this molecule has a linear structure, in which case these polar bonds cancel one another out. Therefore, we end up with a nonpolar compound, as is presented here with these yellow arrows. Now, hydrophilic compounds, well, a non-ionic polar compound is an example of a hydrophilic compound. These compounds are going to dissolve in water because of dipole-dipole interactions. So something that doesn't form an ion, but is polar. So you're thinking about uh, partial charges there, partial positive, partial negative charges. So not like ammonium, for instance, but instead something that has a partial charge, okay? What's another example of, or what's another grouping for potential hydrophilic compounds? Well, your ionic ionic compounds. So carbon dioxide, or sorry, uh, CO, you have, uh, sorry, that was an example of your, your non-ionic. So your dipole-dipole interactions are displayed right here. We have a partial positive charge for this carbon and a partial negative charge for this oxygen. That oxygen, is going to be attracted to in close proximity to that partial positive, positive charge of that carbon. Okay, now switching gears. 
ionic compounds. Ionic compounds readily dissolve in water because of the ionic dipole interactions. So what that means is you have a positive charge, an ion with a positive charge, not a partial charge, that is going to be attracted to partial charges. For instance, here what we see is the structure of something, sorry, the structure of the ionic compound of NaCl. It forms this kind of intricate matrix where a sodium ion is next to a chloride ion, which is next to a sodium ion, which is next to a chloride ion. And ultimately we come back to this NaCl or a one-to-one -one ratio. Well, this molecule, as we know, NaCl dissolves very well in water. Why is that? Well, the reason is, is because when we have H2O represented here, we have something with a partial negative charge and partial positive charge. Well, the partial negative charge, as is presented here, is going to be attracted to that sodium ion. The partial negative charge represented by these two white balls is going to be attracted to that negative charge of the chloride ion. So we're going to end up with a hydrated sodium ion and a hydrated chloride ion. The sodium ion is going to have the partial negative charges of the oxygen in close proximity to the sodium ion, in close proximity. The partial negative charges of the hydrogen, or sorry, the partial positive charges of my hydrogens represented here, here, will be attracted to the overall ion charge, the negative ionic charge of the chloride ion. So that's how we're going to dissolve something like NaCl. That's what's happening at the molecular level. And we care about what's happening at the molecular level because that's going to give us insight into what does what takes place when we dissolve an ion, what also takes place when we dissolve a biological molecule. What are the interactions? What are the intermolecular interactions that are taking place to allow our molecule to dissolve? All right, so there we go. There's our chloride. Yeah. Now, hydrophilic compounds, those are examples that will dissolve. And those are two examples of compounds that do dissolve and how they dissolve. Hydrophobic interactions. Okay. Well, hydrophobic, hydrophobic, water fearing. That's kind of one of the first things when you talk about uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic compounds, you just use that fear phobia or you use that term phobia. It's, it's fearful of this. Hydrophobic interactions. A nonpolar substance does not readily dissolve in water. Okay. It's water fearing. What's that going to look like? Well, the hydrogen bond network of water reorganizes to accommodate that nonpolar substance. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to go from, we have this nice hydrogen bond network, rather than getting that uh, molecule to interact with that hydrogen bond network. Instead, what's going to happen is the water is going to basically make room for it. Um, I always just kind of think about it. I, I like to think of metaphors or analogies. And one analogy I think of is like, if you and some of your friends go to a bar or a party or something like that, and you walk in and every single person at the bar or party is like, eh, and they kind of make space for you, but none of them talk to you. That's an example of a hydrophobic, or sorry, that's what's happening in a hydrophobic interaction because no one's talking to you. No one's interacting with you. Instead, you are talking to the person that you came with and that's about it. Now, a hydrophilic interaction by contrast is you two people walk in together and you go into the bar or the party and you say hi and everyone immediately is like, oh, hey, how's it going? They interact with you. They have you know, they see you're wearing a blue shirt, they start talking to you because you also have a blue shirt or something like that. So here's a visual of that. The way that I always kind of think about this model is here is our hydrogen bond network in the absence of a hydrophobic compound. Then we say plus a nonpolar and I'll use those terms nonpolar hydrophobic substance. When you add that nonpolar hydrophobic substance, here's what happens. 
all these molecules, like this hydrogen bond gets interrupted, this hydrogen bond gets interrupted, so that this nonpolar substance can kind of fill that void. So that hydrophobic or al alkyl group ultimately gets down in there. So what that's going to lead to, this is where we have like one molecule. What that's also going to lead to is if you have multiple hydrophobic compounds or hydrophobic molecules, you have something called aggregation that's going to take place. So here, the molecule, the hydrophobic molecule that we're using as our example is a lipid. So a lipid has, as is illustrated here, a hydrophilic, a water-loving end that forms a nice ion, but it also has this hydrophobic alkyl chain. An alkyl chain, if you're thinking back to organic, that terminology, it's been a minute. Well, that's just a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. There might be a single bond, there might be some double bonds, but it's just this long chain that looks something like that, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. So, so we have these lipid molecules in water that this is all in one solution. And this visual that you have right here on the screen is basically phase one. Over time, what's going to happen is those lipid molecules are going to cluster together. They're going to pack together. And what's going to happen is that these alkyl chains here, here, and here, they're going to kind of assemble where they have a nice, dense hydrophobic region. So a nonpolar solute, so that thing that's being dissolved, not the solvent. Remember, you've got your solvent, which in this case, and anything that we talk about in biochemistry is water. That nonpolar, or sorry, that polar solvent, water, and that nonpolar solute is going to kind of cluster together and organize that water. So when you think about that term, organize, you've increased the order as opposed to increasing the disorder. So this is an example of an increase in the order of water, the order and organization of all these water molecules. Therefore, this is a decrease in entropy. So the hydrophobic effect is, or the hydrophobic packaging of things together is a decrease in entropy. As a result, the nonpolar substances tend to aggregate to reduce the decrease in entropy. So these, these molecules, whenever they cluster together, you're going to see this clustering and aggregation of these molecules. And as a result of these independent molecules mixing up together, the nonpolar substances tend to aggregate to reduce the decrease in entropy. So examples of this so-called hydrophobic effect can be illustrated in the ways that lipids assemble and organize themselves in an aqueous environment. So here, what we have on the left-hand side is what's known as a micelle. And a micelle consists of, well, it's kind of a, it's, it's got a hydrophobic interior, or I'm scribbling. This is a sphere in three dimensions where you have these hydrocarbon tails that have kind of organized together and all pointing in one central point. The polar head group is on the surface and the exterior, and that's going to interact with water with no problem there. You also see this similarly in a bilayer. So I always think about a bilayer as basically a nice pair of sheets where you have a hydro, uh, um, a hydrophobic interior and a hydrophilic kind of surface. So there are molecules that, as you can imagine, and as we kind of illustrated and looked at with a lipid, um, they contain both a polar and a nonpolar group. For instance, we've got, um, or, and these are known as ampopathic molecules. This right here, as you can see, these are pretty complicated molecules, um, but one is the amino acid phenylalanine. And we're going to talk about amino acids in the next lecture, but the region that's highlighted in yellow is your nonpolar region. Like 
when you look at this and you see a hydrophobic group, when you see a six member ring with nothing but carbons and hydrogen, something that's resonance stabilized, I think that there's a tendency appropriately to say, oh, well, that's just carbons and hydrogens. There's, that's not a polar region. And you're absolutely right. So when you see a molecule like phenylalanine, it can have both a polar and a nonpolar region. So don't fall into the trap of, oh, it has to be this or it has to be this. Now, with that said, you can look at molecules and say, well, it might have one polar region, but then tons of it are nonpolar. Like it is something that you can kind of, that you can measure and you can give as um, kind of a spectrum or a range, something that's extremely polar, something that's extremely nonpolar. Um, so here what we have is something as, as a kind of testament to that, if you look at this typical wax, I was just talking a moment ago about how a carbon has a partial positive charge when there's a carbonyl oxygen to it. Well, yeah, I wasn't wrong. With that said though, this partial positive charge is also going to be kind of neutralized by that partial negative charge on that oxygen. And so the kind of pull or the extremeness of that is, is mitigated. And then when you look at the rest of this molecule, we've got a methyl group at the tail end and then we have CH2, we got seven of those. We're talking about one, eight, nine, 10, 16, 17, a 17 carbon chain, that's nothing but carbons and hydrogens versus a total of three atoms. So 17 carbons, and then one, seven more, that's eight, nine, 10, seven, eight, 18 carbons. So we're talking about 35 carbons that are in a, a non-polar grouping, and then one carbon that's in a polar grouping. So, just a comparison of the numbers, that's an instance where you can classify a molecule and say, this is definitely a non-polar molecule. Um, then we've got all of our examples of polar molecules and lots of these molecules we're going to be seeing time and time again. One of them we've already seen and talked about quite a bit and that's glucose. Here we've got glucose as a six member ring structure or six member, yeah, six, six atom ring structure. Glycine is an amino acid, aspartate is an amino acid, lactate is a byproduct of metabolism, and glycerol is your backbone for uh, fatty acids or glycer triglycerides. These are all extremely important biological molecules. Waxes are relevant to biology. Phenylalanine is an amphipathic molecule, is an amino acid, phosphatidylcholine is a signaling molecule. In a biological system, there is kind of room for all of these different types of molecules, whether it's polar, nonpolar, or amphipathic. There's all kind of a spot for them. So, yeah. Um, oh, and one thing that I wanted to also illustrate or bring up is this last item. So, some examples of polar nonpolar amphipathic or amphiphilic molecules shown as ionic forms at a pH of seven. This right here, or this, this last like sentence right here, arguably is the most, yeah, it's the most important uh, takeaway from this lesson and not those words, but instead you need to always be thinking about what is the environment that we're looking at this molecule? Is it a pH of seven? Is it a pH of nine? Is it a pH of three? What is the pH that we're looking at? Okay, so non-covalent bonds determine the complexity of molecular interactions within and between biological molecules. So non-covalent interactions, not your covalent interactions, like a carbon-carbon bond is a covalent interaction or covalent bond. We're talking about non-covalent bonds. Some examples of non-covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole interactions, London dispersion forces, 
arguably all of those really weak interactions are your non-covalent bonds of forces. But think about this. They determine the complexity of molecular interactions within and between biomolecules. Okay, so those weak molecules determine a lot. They're 10 to 100 times weaker than covalent bonds. Single interactions are typically not sufficient to hold two species together. The 3D structure of most macromolecules are determined as a result of the collective influence of many weak individual interactions. So it's not a single bond that holds most biological molecules together. Instead, it's these molecules that are kind of pushed together that are stabilized by a hydrogen bond or a series of hydrogen bonds. So non-covalent bonds, importantly, are reversible. They're weak, so they might be kind of transient or there might be some kind of flexibility to them. Non-covalent bonds and non-covalent interactions are specific as well. Um, so the size, shape, and type of interaction all must be correct for binding between molecules to take place. Now, here is a list of, or a comparison of your covalent interactions and your non-covalent interactions. So here, if you look at the top of this table, this is showing the strength of different covalent bonds. Um, an oxygen-hydrogen bond, a carbon-hydrogen bond, and a carbon-carbon bond. The strength of these bonds is in the hundreds of kilojoules per mole. So it requires an input of hundreds of kilojoules uh, energy per mole of that bond. Now, if you compare all those, and these aren't specific numbers that you need to know, but instead think about the magnitude of difference between your covalent bonds and your non-covalent bonds. Now, um, if we look at our non-covalent interactions, we have an ionic interaction. So just to kind of, the point of these is to look at specific non-covalent interactions. We've got an ionic interaction. We've got a, our van der Waals forces fall into three different examples. We've got a hydrogen bond, a dipole-dipole interaction, and then London dispersion forces, also known as your induced dipole uh, interactions. So I think that the, I don't know if I would say the most important, but the the most relevant to our class is the top three here, your ionic, all the way down to your dipole-dipole interactions, because we do deal with a lot of um, carbonyl groups. Um, but if you look at this ionic interaction, it has a bond strength of 86 kilojoules per mole. Hydrogen bond is 20 kilojoules per mole and a dipole-dipole interaction is 9.3 kilojoules per mole. So even within these non-covalent interactions, which are weaker than our covalent interaction, there's a spectrum of ranging from your strongest to your weakest. Um, and the ones that are important to us, they range from your strongest to your weakest. So we'll first look at our hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonding is one of the most important interactions of biological molecules. Hydrogen bonding is an interaction between a covalently bound hydrogen in a donor group and a pair of non-covalent electrons on an electron uh, on an acceptor group. So identifying a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor is a, an important part of hydrogen bonding. So here what we have is, and the way that I kind of think about it is which of the atoms has the hydrogen or which of the groups has the hydrogen? Well, the group that has the hydrogen in a covalent bond indicated right here is going to be your donor. And then the group that has the electrons is going to be the acceptor. So the ability of a group to act as a hydrogen bond donor depends on the electronegativity. And the good thing is that this hydrogen bond donor well, we're really going to kind of have a limited set of groups that this is possible for. So the bond must be polar. So there must be some electronegativity difference, must have a free pair of electrons, uh, or sorry, the, the acceptor must have free pair of electrons or a formal negative charge. Carbon hydrogen bonds are never polar. 
as we previously said, so they are never going to be participating in a hydrogen bond. Instead, more times than not, when we think about hydrogen bonds, we're going to be thinking about, well, I'm just going to draw an R group here. Lone pair of electrons, hydrogen, and hydrogen. This is a good example of a hydrogen bond donor, just as this right here is a good example of a hydrogen bond donor. So the strongest hydrogen bonds have the donor atom and the acceptor atom 180 degrees apart. Nonlinear hydrogen bonds are considerably weaker. So here, the oxygen, hydrogen, and oxygen are all in one even plane. So this is our donor, and this is our acceptor. These three atoms are in a straight plane. One, two, three. These three atoms, acceptor, all of these acceptors are shown on the right-hand side, and our donors on the left-hand side. All these donors are great or because all three of these atoms are in a straight line. Now, if we compare that to, and it's important to, or it's, it might be tough to wrap your mind around, um, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, these are not atoms in the same straight line. If this oxygen right here were instead right here, it'd be a different story, but that's not the case. This is really to illustrate a weaker hydrogen bond. So when we look back at something like this table right here, we have a hydrogen bond that's approximately 20 kilojoules per mole. Well, that illustrated right there is our three atoms that are all in straight plane. This, by contrast, we've got our three atoms in a straight plane, and then we've got a weak hydrogen bond where our three atoms are not in a straight plane. Now, here's a good example of common hydrogen bonds. Remember, as is illustrated here, the hydrogen bond donor and the hydrogen bond acceptor. The atom which is covalently bound to the hydrogen is your donor. And the, the atom with the electrons is your acceptor. So our donors are all shown across the bottom. So oxygen or nitrogen is going to have that hydrogen to it and then um, or bound to it covalently. And then the oxygen or nitrogen is the acceptor as well, because it's going to have a lone pair of electrons. Now, here's some of the biologically relevant hydrogen bonds that we will see this over the course of the semester. And these are also bringing in, um, the first two are looking at some of the functional groups that you're probably familiar with from organic. Um, so we have a hydroxyl group of an alcohol and water. Um, so if you think about a sugar, for instance, we've already kind of seen this, where we have a covalently bound hydrogen to an oxygen hydroxyl group and a water molecule. So basically what this is saying is that there are hydrogen bonds between sugars and their aqueous environment. Um, between the carbonyl group of a ketone, and here we've got our ketone, our carbonyl oxygen, and water. In both cases, water is the, or sorry, in one case, we have water acting as, that's right, that is the acceptor. And then we have this guy right here is your donor. In this case, on the bottom, or on the, the, the second one, we have water acting as the donor. And this is your acceptor. So it's good to be able to identify, one, if you see a hydrogen bond, two, is that hydrogen bond, or is that functional group a hydrogen bond donor or hydrogen bond acceptor? Now, between peptide groups, or sorry, between groups within two different peptides. We haven't talked about peptides quite yet, but keep this in mind because we will bring it back up. Um, a polypeptide is a string of amino acids. So this is kind of a, it's like a snapshot or cross section of a part of protein. If we look at this, we can dissect that we've got one chain right here. I'm gonna label it chain A and this is chain B. Well. Chain A has an NH, so this is a hydrogen bond, this is a donor. Chain B has an acceptor. Now, 
one of the things that's cool about this and that's interesting about this is that if you look at chain B and then it, you, you compare the donor of chain A, what we have is nitrogen bound to a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. Well, if we look at that group, that's a donor in this particular interaction. Then let's go up here. We've got a nitrogen bound to a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. Well, could that potentially be a hydrogen bond donor? Absolutely. Then if we go down here, we have carbon with a double bond to an oxygen. This could be an acceptor for potentially either water or another peptide bond. Now, something that we have looked at, we have talked about nucleotides, um, nucleosides, we've talked about um, nitrogenous bases. Here, what we've got is thymine and adenine. Well, thymine, we've got a hydrogen bond donor and we've got a hydrogen bond acceptor. Then with adenine, adenine has a group that's acting as an acceptor and acts as a donor. So we've got this within the bonds between A and T, you've got a bond, an acceptor and a donor in both cases. Or sorry, you have both, you have two, you have an example of both part of that molecule acting as an acceptor and acting as a donor. So you couldn't really look at this and say, is thymine exclusively a hydrogen bond acceptor? No. Adenine is not is similarly not a hydrogen bond donor. We've got the donation and the acceptance. Now, what that's ultimately going to lead to is the structure shown on the right here. We have those hydrogen bonds, those two or three hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. And this second example, where we were looking, third example, when we were looking at peptide groups and polypeptide, well, this would be chain A and this would be chain B, where we have those hydrogen bonds that are going to stabilize those two different chains to one another. Now, I'm not going to go too hard in on the model that's shown on the left hand side with uh, hydrogen bonding and proteins, but I think it is important to be able to look at a nitrogenous space or a pair of nitrogenous spaces and identify which group is the hydrogen bond acceptor, which group is the hydrogen bond donor. So that ultimately is going to lead to the stabilization of our DNA double helix. Now, with all that in mind, one of the things that I previously talked about was in a something being in a solution, pH of seven. So when we talk about an aqueous environment, it's important to think back to acids and bases. Now, weak acids versus uh, strong acids. A strong acid, for instance, HCl. If you add HCl to water, what's going to happen? it's going to 100% dissociate into this and this. Meanwhile, if you took something like this, CH3COOH, that's acetic acid. If you add acetic acid to water, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get some of this, the acetate ion, you're going to get some hydrogen ions, but what you're also going to get is CH3COOH because some of it's not going to go into solution. So that's an example of a weak acid. A weak acid is not going to 100 or it's not going to completely dissociate, whereas a strong acid will completely dissociate. Now, if you think back to Gen Chem 1 and Gen Chem 2, when you talk about strong acids and, and weak acids, there's about seven strong acids and everything else is a weak acid. Weak acids only partially dissociate. So in our class, when we talk about an acid, more times than not, it's going to be one of those weak acids. I mean, I might use 
or discuss a titration with HCl and say, well, we're titrating with HCl, a strong acid. What's that going to do? But quite often we're just looking at, well, a weak acid. Okay, so we have that partial dissociation. And if we look at an equilibrium constant, we come up with something like this, our products on top and our reactant on the bottom. Now, that gives us an ionization constant for a weak acid, HA in water. Now, negative log of a Ka or a pKa is basically giving a measure of the strength of an acid. The smaller that the pKa, the more acidic or stronger that weak acid is. The larger that a Ka is, the more acidic, stronger the weak acid. So the larger the Ka, the more acidic and stronger, the smaller the pKa. So that's one thing to, you know, more times than not, we're going to be talking about pKa's. So if there were one of these two points that you were like, I can't reconcile that, I just need to follow one of them. I would say this first one, the smaller the pKa, the more acidic and stronger the weak acid or stronger the acid is. So the proton has a strong tendency to dissociate. And in other words, the dissociation is pushed to the right or to that hydrogen ion. So here we've got measures of different um, acids. If we look at this and think about it as the smaller the pK, the more acidic, then what we'd do is we'd say something like, well, let's go with glycine, for instance. Glycine has a pK of 9.78. And oxalic acid has a pKa of 1.27. Which one of them is a stronger acid? No, well, oxalic acid. This is displayed as the strength of acid being highest at the top and the weakest acids are at the bottom. And if something is a strong weak acid, then it is a weak, weak base. I'm gonna primarily be focusing on terminology relating to acids um, and not quite so much talking about. So here what we've got is that list and we're gonna proceed with talking about strong weak acids and weak, weak acids uh, primarily now. The relationship between pH and pKa is what's arguably going to be the most important thing that we talk about with respect to uh, this. Um, just because if something is going to, it's going to give you a sense of if something forms an ion or not. And as we know back here, if something forms an ion, then it can participate in a strong non-covalent interaction like an ionic interaction. If it can't form an ion, can it still interact? Absolutely, it can have a hydrogen bond, but that's not as strong as an ionic interaction. Okay, so weak acids are going to ionize in water. They're going to dissociate. The resulting change in pH is determined by two factors, the pKa of the conjugate acid-base pair, the concentration of the conjugate acid-base pair, which gives us ultimately this right here. So, this is known as the, or this, this equation is known as the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Now this equation is pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the concentration of the deprotonated form versus the protonated form of the substance. And this is something that the equation itself, I'm gonna give you. Um, processing and understanding this equation is something that people struggle with. Um, but ultimately, the way that I kind of look at this is when you see that P, P, what is that? Let's jump back for a minute. PKA is equal to negative log of Ka. So you could also ultimately look at this as negative log is equal to that lowercase p. So essentially what this is, is an equation that gives us H, Ka, plus a ratio. 
because we've got log in there. Now, I will give some examples um, because I think that this is this is so pivotal to understanding different types of interactions. And if you understand interactions within a molecule and its surroundings, then you've got a great or you're in a strong position to understand interactions between proteins and interactions between biomolecules. Now, depending on the compound, the charged form could be the protonated or the deprotonated form. So this right here, lots of people fall into the trap of thinking protonated, that means positive. That is not the case. The charged form could be the protonated or the deprotonated. Now, we're gonna look at some examples that will hopefully illustrate that. So if we look at, here's the derivation basically of our equation. This is what I want you to know. I want you to know that equation and really how to process it, but I'm gonna provide it for you. Um, so whenever I say I want you to know it, I don't need you to memorize it, but I want you to understand the, the moving parts of it. Um, this is a relationship between the protonated concentration and the deprotonated concentration of the substance. So ultimately what this tells us is that if the pH minus pKa is negative three, we have a ratio that we favor the deprotonated form over the protonated form. If, it's, if pH minus pKa is positive three, then we have a higher concentration of the pro, uh, deprotonated form over the protonated form. When the pH is equal to the pKa, we have an equal concentration of the protonated and deprotonated forms of, of a molecule. These three lines, the green, red, and blue lines, I think are, are I think they say a lot because they give you the ratios of the protonated and the deprotonated forms depending on pH. So this one in the middle, when the pH is equal to the pKa. So let's imagine that the pH is three and the pKa is three. If those are equal to one another, three minus three equals zero, okay? Now, if the pH is one and the pKa for a molecule is four, that would be negative three. The pH is one, the pKa is four. If the pH is one, that means we have tons and tons of the protonated form. If the pH is seven and the pKa is four, we're going to have a difference of positive three. So we're going to favor the deprotonated form. So I'm gonna write this as favor prot favor dip or the deprotonated form. When pH and pKa are equal to one another, well, they are equally favored. So they cancel one another out. So a titration curve, and in just a minute, we'll look at this in a slightly different angle. Um, Titration curves give an experimental way to determine pKa. A titration is an experiment that you did in Gen Chem 1, you do in Gen Chem 2, or in the Gen Chem 1 lab, and then the Gen Chem 2 lab. It's an experiment in which measured amounts of a strong base are added to an acidic solution. The strong base is added in small amounts until the acid is neutralized. The titration curve is a plot of the pH versus the amount of strong base added. The titration curve is analyzed to give the inflection point, the point in an acid-base titration at which enough base has been added to neutralize 50% of the acid. So that's another way of looking at that is when your acid concentration is equal to your base concentration, your pH is equal to your pKa. Your end point or your equivalence point is the point in an acid-base titration at which enough base has been added to exactly neutralize the acid. So this right here, 
is grouped together. Now, here are, wait just a second. Um, The inflection point is when the acid concentration is equal to the base concentration. And the end or your equivalence point is the point when all of the acid has been neutralized by base. Okay. Now, a visual of that. Here's our inflection point. Here's our equivalence point. Our inflection point is where we have an equal concentration of our deprotonated form of our molecule and our protonated form of our molecule. 50% of the acid, this guy right here, has been neutralized by hydroxide or our strong base. Then on this end right here, where we have our equivalence point, how much of our, so if we look at our WA or our weak acid, acetate, and the corresponding or conjugate base is that acetate ion. When you hit your equivalence point, 100% of this weak acid has been converted to that right there. So that means that 0% of the molecule exists as CH3COOH. So our equivalence point means or another way of looking at this is no weak acid remains. It's all been taken care of by the hydroxide. Okay, then right here on the opposite end of the spectrum, well, 100% of the weak acid is present or remains. So we've got, as we move from the origin point right here, right on this graph, we are adding base to neutralize small amounts of that weak acid. And slowly but surely, we neutralize that weak acid. More and more of that weak acid gets neutralized until ultimately we neutralize all of it. Now, this inflection point is where pH equals our pKa. That's illustrated in these two different models. These curves should look the exact same because they are the exact same, basically. I don't need to use a qualifying word, basically. pH is at 4.76. The pKa for this molecule is 4.76. Every molecule is going to have a buffering region where they are going to kind of endure additions of small amounts of uh, acid or base, and the pH isn't going to change dramatically. That buffering region is generally plus or minus one unit from pKa. So if your pKa is 4.76, your buffering region goes all the way down to 3.76, all the way up to 5.76. These are all things that I've pointed out. Um, on the left-hand side of this model in green, you see that the concentration of our protonated form is greater than that of our deprotonated form. On the right-hand side, our deprotonated form has a concentration higher than our protonated form. Basically, are we to the left of our inflection point or are we to the right of our inflection point? Now, this right here is a pretty complicated figure. What this is showing is titration curves for three different molecules or three different weak acids. We've got CH3COOH, we've got H2PO4 minus one, and we've got NH4 plus. NH4 plus, well, at, if, if you had this molecule in a solution with a pH of one, 100% of that molecule looks like this. The pKa of this molecule is 9.25. If you had it at a pH of, let's say, 4, it's still going to look like this. If you had it at a pH of, let's say, 8, 
Well, what am I talking about right here? So now about 95% of the molecule looks like that. And that means that 5% looks like this. So we have these dramatic changes um, based on, or we have these, these changes based on a molecule's pKa. Is it singly protonated or is it doubly protonated? Now, one thing that I, I wanna bring up with respect to that is let's compare these three molecules right here. We've got NH4, H2PO4, and CH3COOH. All of these molecules are protonated and they get deprotonated and convert to CH3CO minus, HPO4 2 minus, and NH3, the deprotonated forms of the molecule. All of those protonated molecules, one of them is positively charged, one of them is negatively charged, and one of them has no charge whatsoever. Our deprotonated forms, well, one of those deprotonated forms has a single negative charge, one of those deprotonated forms has a uh, two minus charge, and one of those deprotonated molecules has no charge whatsoever. So it's important to remember that connection between protonated and deprotonated. Or sorry, protonated and deprotonated and uh, charged and uncharged. There are molecules that are monoprotic, so that means they have one proton that they can lose and gain. There are di and triprotic molecules as well. Diprotics are going to take on two protons and triprotics will take on three protons. Compounds are classified according to the number of protons that can dissociate. One dissociable or one dissociable proton is a monoprotic acid. Two possible ionic forms can exist for that. The protonated and the deprotonated form for a monoprotic acid. Now, if a molecule has two protons that can it can lose, it is considered a diprotic acid. And as a diprotic acid, it has three possible ionic forms. One form is H2A, doubly protonated, no charge. Another is HA minus, where it's lost one of those two protons. And then a third is where it's lost both protons, and it has an, a two negative charge. If a molecule has three dissociable protons, it is considered tripotent. And go ahead and looking at this trend, one dissociable proton has two forms. Two dissociable protons has three forms. If it has three dissociable protons, it's going to have four forms. Those forms are H3A, H2A minus, HA2 minus, and A3 minus. The structure varies as a function of pH. H3A is not the same as HA2 minus. Because look at this. This has three protons. And this right here has a two minus charge in one proton. An amphiprotic molecule can donate or accept a proton. This is, there's a specialized type of amphoterism where a molecule functions as an acid and a base. So when you think about something that acts as an acid and a base, the first thing that pops to my mind is water. It can act as an acid or it can act as a base. It can either donate a proton or accept a proton, depending on the environment. Here, what we have is a triprotic acid, phosphoric acid, H3PO4. As it has one, two, three, and four different forms, it has four different forms. It's going to have one, two, and three pKa's. One proton that it's going to lose very easily at a neutral pH, one that it may or may not have a, at a neutral pH, which looking at our y-axis, here's our neutral pH. And then one proton that it's going to have only whenever, or it's going to lose only when the environment is extremely basic. So this has four different forms, four different ionic forms, and three dissociable protons. Thank mm -hmm. you.
This right here, this line must start at a low pH or fully protonated and proceed to a high pH. That is very valuable advice when it comes to um, drawing an amino acid. I always recommend you draw it at a very low pH and add base to get it to a very high pH. So my thought is draw that molecule in its most protonated form and then adjust to what is the pH. So if you say, what does H3PO4 look like at pH of nine? What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, what are the pKa's? Well, one pKa is two, and another pKa is 6.5, and the last is 12.3. Okay, so the first proton's pKa is two. The second proton's pKa is 6.5. 6.5 is below nine, and nine is below 12.3. So that means that chances are it has definitely lost the first proton. So the form of H3PO4 at a pH of 9, well, it's not H3. So I've got HPO4. It's not 3. So I can get rid of that as an option. It's also not 2 because my pH is greater than that second pKa. Instead, what I'm looking at is HPO4, 2 minus. This is a figure that shows several different molecules and the progression that they make based on pH. So pH ranges on our x-axis. Our y-axis is just showing a couple of different molecules. pKa of 9.25. NH4 plus goes to NH3. Acetic acid has a pKa of 4.76. So 4.76 is right about here. CH3COOH goes to CH3CO minus. Our other molecules, and there are multiple triprotic acids, and we'll talk about a lot of triprotic acids, but they are going to progress from fully protonated to fully deprotonated given, well, what is the pH? So if, you know, the example that I was just using was at a pH of nine, what does H3PO4 look like? Well, here's pH of nine, it's gonna be right here. So I'm between 6.86, which I use different numbers here than I used here, but I'm between those two pKa values. So the form of the molecule is going to be that form, which is the same. I don't care about the proton. Instead, I'm caring about, well, I'm looking at HPO4 two minus. Now, with that in mind, and considering the, the different forms that a molecule can take on, um, we are not going to, uh, or I'm not going to expect you to memorize PKAs. I will provide you with PKAs. So don't stress about that at all. I think that it's helpful to know a couple of them just so you can have like an example that you can rest your your understanding of this concept and process on. And for me, I always just think of acetic acid. Acetic acid right here dissociates into an acetate ion and a proton. pK of 4.76. Okay, good. If my pH is below 4.76, I'm dealing with this. If my pH is above 4.76, the predominant form of the molecule looks like that. Okay, so those are all essential for understanding pH and pKa and what form of a molecule exists given a particular pH. Now, biological systems are buffered. Buffers are solutions that resist changes in pH as acid and base are added to them. We talked about a buffering range a little bit ago. Um, and basically you can add acid to a buffered system and the pH isn't going to drop. You can add base and the pH isn't going to drop dramatic, or it's, it's not going to go way up. It might change a little bit, but it all depends on what is the pH that you're aiming for. Uh, or it, it all depends on uh, what the molecule is and, you know, relative concentrations.
So most buffers consist of a weak acid in the conjugate base. The titration curve is flat near the pKa of the buffer. Structure is resistant to change in pH. The best area to buffer is that buffering range, plus or minus one pH unit around a, or plus or minus one pH unit. So with that in mind, if you had a molecule that had a pKa of 4.76, we'll say, is this going to be a good buffer at a pH of seven? No, it's not. It's going to be a good buffer from 3.76 all the way up to 5.76. Outside of that, it's not. A now, the buffer capacity is related to the concentrations of the weak, and acid, the weak acid and the conjugate base. The greater the concentration of the weak acid and its conjugate base, the greater the buffer capacity. So if you have a huge concentration of that weak acid and its conjugate base, well, then you're going to be able to add more and more acid and the pH isn't going to change. Whereas if you have a low concentration, um, then that buffer will be consumed very quickly and it's not going to be, or that, sorry, the weak acid and the conjugate base are going to be consumed very quickly. And so their ratio is going to be thrown off. Now, examples of biological buffers, the phosphate buffer is the principal buffer in cells. A carbonic acid buffer or the carbonate ion buffer, H2CO3, HCO3 minus is important for respiration um, and ultimately the buffer in your blood because CO2 as a gas becomes aqueous. It's going to react with H2O to make H2CO3. H2CO3 will dissociate into HCO3 minus and that aqueous gas will react with the proton to go back to form CO2 gas and H2O. Now, when you're breathing, um, it's this buffer that is going to uh, basically maintain your, your pH, or it's going to cause, I apologize, cause your blood pH to go up. Hyperventilation, for example, can increase your blood pH. So you remove CO2, the, C, the hydrogen ion combines with HCO3 to produce more of uh, that, or to produce more hydrogen ions, and therefore your pH is going to go up. Or it's going to cause a decrease in your hydrogen ion concentration, causing your pH to go up. Now, hypoventilation can result in a decreased blood pH. The increased CO2, it combines with H2O to produce more hydrogen ions. That hydrogen ion concentration increasing is going to cause the pH to go down. Now, this can also be metabolically induced. The decreases in blood pH will result in increased breathing rates. pH goes down, hydrogen ion concentration goes up. So hydrogen ion combined with HCO3 to produce more CO2. Um, increases in blood pH, which is very rare. Uh, this can happen through, uh, depending on a, the type of hemoglobin or something that is in your bloodstream. Um, it can cause increases in blood pH and it's going to result in decreased breathing rate. pH goes up, your hydrogen ion concentration goes down to compensate the CO2 combines with H2O. And ultimately, that's it with respect to water and buffers. There's a lot to unpack here. I think that this is a great conceptual thing because it shows different molecules and how they change based on an acidic environment or a basic environment. It shows all the different forms that they can take on. And when they take on those different forms, what can happen to them? What's the predominant form of a molecule at a pH? Another kind of illustration, or just to go through that one more time, we can use this molecule that I just drew a bunch of circles around. I'm going to scribble out everything else. So we have a singular focus. This is the amino acid glycine. At a pH of one, the predominant form is going to look like this. When the pH is 2.34, you have a mixture of this and of this. Mm -hmm. 
when the pH is above 2.34, well then this right here is going to be your predominant form. At a pH of, let's say, 2.6, you could have picked 2.5, 2.7, um, anything within the buffering range of this pKa, so all the way up to 3.34, there is basically none of this. There's still some of this. The predominant form at a pH of 2.6 is this form. This is the uh, minority form. Now at a pH of 7.2, well, we've got the predominant form of the molecule that looks like this, which is the same as at a pH of 2.6. But now it's a little bit different. This is a calculation that we'll get into in our amino acids discussion. At a pH of 7.2, we've got a mixture of this form and this form. Now at a pH of 7.2, it's going to be something like 99.5% looks like this and 0.5% looks like this. But at a pH of 7.2, 0% of it looks like this form. So a molecule is going to change. It's going to be deprotonated. It's going to be protonated. It's going to have groups with positive charges and negative charges. It's going to group, have groups that get protonated and have no charge whatsoever. It's very important that you can look at a molecule and know the functional groups that you're dealing with and what are the implications of those functional groups being present and basically what form of the molecule is going to be present based on pH. All right, well, I hope that was helpful. This is your primer for discussing and looking at amino acids. I want you to understand amino acids. I want you to process their structure. And if you have a grasp on this, you're gonna be in great shape. All right, well, have a good one and I'll see you later.